course. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so yeah, my name is Martin Erickson. I am sometimes better known as the big friendly giant for reasons which should be perfectly obvious today. <laughs> I am the founder of Product Tank, which is the world's largest community of product managers. We have meetups in over 125 cities around the world. And the co-founder of Mind of Products, which is this conference. But before that, I was a product manager for nearly 20 years in corporate environments, startup environments in Sweden, the UK, the US. And basically that means I've been building stuff online since the internet came on floppy disks. So I've been doing this for a while. I also have the claim to have done the first online live stream in Europe. So I beat Periscope, Facebook Live, and Snapchat to the punch. By 20 years, I'll just stand back here. Um, of course, at the time, you couldn't just do it on your mobile phone. It did take a giant satellite truck and five engineers from the local telco to actually make it run. But it kind of worked. And fast forward to about seven, ten years ago, I was working at a software as a service startup in London. Imagine the office through these gates, down in the dark basement. We had all the usual startup paraphernalia. We had naked brick walls. We had whiteboards and post-its everywhere. We had a foosball table in one corner, an Xbox in the other corner. And on a gray day in November, we were gathered around one of those whiteboards doing a retrospective on a recent release. The whole team had gathered around, and this was one of the biggest releases that we'd done since I joined as a VP of products. We had totally rewritten and redesigned a core part of the feature set over a number of sprints. And this was a huge success. Every metric went up and to the right the way you wanted to do. Conversion was up, engagement was up, and customer satisfaction was up. Even the team was happy, and the retrospective was almost entirely positive, which is kind of amazing in and of itself, because they look like this most of the time. But what I learned from these experiences, and many, many more, is that product management is not actually about products. Product management is about people. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today, is how you embrace that, how you build great product teams, and how you put people back in the center of the product process. So, product management is a team sport. And it starts, like any good heist movie, by putting together your heist team. You have to pick the right people on your team to have the right skill set that you need. I'm somewhat famous for having first drawn this Venn diagram that defines product management as the intersection of products, of technology, customer, and business. The problem with this is everyone thinks that you have to have all of these skills to be great at product. You have to look like this. But in reality, as you all know, we look like this. Or we look like this. Or like this. Not everyone can have all those skills. They're unicorns. They don't exist. It's only when we come together as a team that we can have all the skills that we need. And you have to think a step beyond that as well. You have to think about diversity of skills. So those are just three of the elements. And depending on your company and your team and your product and your market, the axes that you choose are going to be different. But it's important to think about what work experience and industry knowledge people have. How, are they creative? What culture and what life experience can they bring? Because at the end of the day, you want to try and map your team out and your hires out against these different axes. And again, figure out how can you find complementary skill sets? How can you find people that have these different approaches and perspectives? Because at the end of the day, building great products is about having empathy with your customers. And the more empathy you can have in your team, the more empathy you have with each other. Some people have kids and have to go home, can't go out drinking beer. Some people are young and want to do that. Like any level of empathy that you can develop within your team, you're going to be able to reflect that with your customer. So products is a team sport. I also say a lot that I don't care what your job title is. I don't care if you're a designer. I don't care if you're a product manager. I don't care if you're an engineer. I don't care if you're a business analyst, data scientist. We are all product people, and we all own the product together. And it's only by working as a team together that we build great products. Marty Kagan, who's probably the godfather of modern product management, is famous for saying that if you only use your engineers to code, you're only getting half of their value. But I would argue that this is true for designers, product managers, everyone else. If you're only
only using product managers to write stories, you're probably getting half the value. You're only using designers to push pixels around in Photoshop, you're probably getting half the value. The more everyone can be involved and bring their different experiences and their different skill sets to bear, the better your results are going to be. So it's about building cross-functional teams. And the reason this is so important, having all the skills in the team, is that as soon as you have more than one team, you inevitably get friction. As soon as you have a company that looks like this, was when you need project management protocols, you need inbox processes, everyone needs to figure out how does this team ask that team for help. And that team goes, yeah, that's interesting, I'll help you in six months' time, which stops that team from actually being successful. So the more you can put everything you need in one team, the better. I think the best example of this is a company in London called TransferWise. So TransferWise is a fintech company that does online currency transfers, and they have a team called the Currencies Team. That team is solely responsible for launching new currencies, so if you want to transfer dollars to pounds, they are the ones that launch that new currency. And of course to do that, it's not just a design or engineering challenge, it's not just let's add a drop down for USD and we're done. You have to open bank accounts. You have to create new licensing agreements. You have to make sure that your agreements are legal in both the US and the UK. So this team, in a normal company, would have to go talk to a legal department to get permission to write new agreements. They'd have to go talk to a banking department and ask for permission to open a bank account. And you all know how slow that can be. So what TransferWise has done instead is they put all those people in the team. They have a banker. They have a, a lawyer on top of the engineers, the designers, and the product people, so that they're completely autonomous, have all the skills they need, and can actually execute anything that they need to do to be successful. The second part of this is being co-located. I know this is a particular challenge here in the Ukraine with a lot of outsourcing and a lot of remote working, but I think there's a huge amount of value in having those people sitting together and having those high bandwidth conversations with each other in the room. You don't have to wait for a Skype call, you don't have to wait for the weekly meeting, you can just turn around and go, wait a minute, why is this not working the way it's supposed to? How can we do this better? And it's important that the team is co-located, even if the customer is far away. Because at the end of the day, I think that's much better than having UX and product near the customer, but separate from their designers and their engineers and everyone else who's actually going to build the product. So put them back in the team, Figure out how to get to the customer. You need to go talk to the customer. We're going to have a lot more talks about that today. But you can do that remotely. You can go there, visit them, come back to the team, bring that knowledge back, and have everyone working together. So now that you've picked your team, you've got all your skills, you have your perfect heist team, you have to create their environment. And this isn't about the ball pit, although that can be fun. This isn't about the foosball table. It's about thinking about what makes a team successful. How many of you have heard of Project Aristotle at Google? Let's see one hand. So Google did this really fascinating study where their HR team spent three years looking at all the teams in Google, in, at least in Silicon Valley, measured everything they could measure to try and figure <laughs> out what it is that makes their teams successful. And being Google, of course, they figured the more Stanford engineers we can cram into a team, the more successful it's going to be. The more um, patents and PhDs we have on a team, the more successful it's going to be. But what they found is that those things have no correlation whatsoever with success. And you've probably seen actually that Google have completely changed their hiring practices away from some of those requirements. So they don't require you to have a computer science degree anymore. They don't require some of those really difficult IQ questions that they've been asking. And it's because they found five keys to team success. And the number one, by far, that had the most impact on success was this concept of psychological safety. It's where team members feel safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other. These other things are important, but you'll see none of these have degrees, none of these have hard skills. They're all about soft skills. They're all about being able to communicate, be dependable, and have a functioning team. So psychological safety means that everyone in the team is more likely to admit mistakes to each other. But we're also more likely to take on new roles and new challenges. We're more likely to harness new and diverse ideas. 
And most importantly, we're more likely to challenge the status quo. We won't accept something as the way it works. And that, as we all know, is how you create an innovative team. Connected to this is figuring out what motivates a team. In another study done by Dan Pink at MIT, they looked at a number of things that motivate knowledge workers. We all know the kind of old carrot and stick model that worked really well in the Industrial Revolution when we weren't very high skilled. But for us software developers, designers, all of these creative jobs that are all about knowledge and information, money isn't the primary motivator. Of course, we all want just enough money that we can have the lifestyle we want. But what they noticed when they did these studies is that having kind of innovation bonuses or having other incentives like that that were based on cash had no actual impact on innovation or motivation as a team. So he wrote this great book called Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. There's also a 20 minute TED talk if you want the Cliff Notes short version. And came up with three things that really drive motivation. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is our desire to be self-directed and it increases engagement with the team over compliance with orders. Mastery is our urge to get better skills and master our craft, which is hopefully why you are all here today. And purpose is the desire to do something that has meaning and is important. So if you can find a way to hit one, two, or all three of these with your teams, they're going to be much more motivated to take part, to come up with great new ideas, and really help you drive your product and your team forward. And the final piece about making your team successful is choosing how to lead. There's kind of three main theories of leadership. There's authoritative, participative, and delegative. Authoritative is where you set clear expectations, but the manager makes decisions with little or no input from their team. It's very task-driven, and it works well when labor is low skill and the leader has all the knowledge and experience. Your classic kind of 18th century factory, basically, where all you have to do is kind of repetitive actions, and you don't need that much skill. Participative is a little bit more modern. The leader gives hands-on guidance, but retains, um, gets input from the team, and, but retains all the final decision making. This is very collaborative, in the way it's screen, very collaboration driven, and it works well where workers have some knowledge or as much knowledge as the leader, but the leader wants to retain decision making at the top. The third one is how most successful teams that I see work today, where the leader is still there to give high level guidance, to give that alignment, but the team retains the decision making. The team makes all of the decisions autonomously. It's a very people driven way to do it, and it embraces the fact that we're all creative, we're all knowledge workers, and we have as much or more information. Autonomy simply motivates teams better. It also scales better, because you can carve out these small autonomous teams, like the current system at transfer was. It means that you can stay quick and nimble, even though you're scaling to a huge size. And it works, because basically your team is smarter than you are. And they're also much, much closer to the customer than you are. So they have much more information than you do. So why shouldn't they be making the decisions rather than have to report up to you or your boss or your boss's boss's boss to make those final decisions? Now a lot of people hear autonomy and they think, well that means anarchy, that's chaos, everyone can do whatever they want. That's never going to work in my company. But it's all about um, alignment, uh, it's all about autonomy with accountability. And there's this great chart by Henrik Niebuhr, who is kind of the agile coach and organization designer at Spotify where he maps out alignment and autonomy. And obviously if you start with low alignment and low autonomy, it's kind of a micromanaging organization, but a very indifferent culture, and everyone's kind of doing whatever they want anyway. High alignment but low autonomy, you have a very authoritative boss who goes, this is, this is the problem and this is how we're going to solve it, this is what you need to do, just go do it. It's a very authoritative organization. And it's very conformist as well. Everyone just does what they're told. There's no independent thinking. There's no creativity. There's no innovation. High autonomy but low alignment. It's probably most typical startups. It's very entrepreneurial. It's very chaotic. 
everyone's kind of running around in different directions. The boss kind of hopes somebody's working on the problem. And like any two by two chart, you always want to be on the top right. High autonomy and high alignment is where the manager is still there to set the alignment, to set the goals, to give the mission, but the team is allowed to figure out how to get there themselves. And this is how you build innovative organizations and a collaborative culture. And it comes from how you set your goals. So most traditional companies, the company will have their goals, they'll tell the teams, this is what your goal is, go execute that. Each team goes and tells their individuals, this is what you need to execute. And then a quarter later or a year later, you realize you missed all your targets because the people at the top had no idea what they could actually deliver. In an autonomous world, you still start at the top. You start with that vision, you start with the company goals, but then you stop. And you shut up. And you let each team go and figure out what can they do to contribute to those goals. And each team goes off and figures out, well, we're responsible for new currencies, or we're responsible for the onboarding, or whatever part of the product that they're responsible for. And they figure out what can we do within that remit to help achieve that company goal. And once they figure that out, then they come to you and they report, this is what we can do. And the beauty of this is that you'll immediately know if you have a gap. Instead of waiting six months or a year till the end of the planning process and realizing that two or three teams didn't hit the goals that you gave them, these commitments that the teams make when they come up to you will quickly reveal teams that aren't performing, but also where maybe you need more resources or you need um, new kind of market areas or whatever it is to be able to realistically hit that goal. And it's all, always better to know that up front. Which also relates to measuring success. So one of the key things I always talk about here is focusing on outcomes. I hope most of you have heard this quote before, that people don't want a quarter inch drill when they go to the hardware store. They want a quarter inch hole. But I would actually argue you need to think even deeper than that. You need to ask why. You need to ask them why do they need the hole. You really need to understand the customer. Because there's lots of other solutions than getting a drill if they want to hang a TV on the wall, if they want to hang a picture on the wall, if they want to get music from one room to the next room, if they want to get an electric cable from one room to the next room. If you're actually understanding what it is that they're trying to do, you can design a product that solves that problem. As Albert Einstein said, you always want to quote Albert Einstein in a talk, it's always a good one. If I had one hour to save the planet, I would spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute resolving it. And as my friend Ken Norton said, who is the product partner at Google Ventures, once you really understand the problem at a deep level, success is easy to articulate because you know what it looks like by the absence of that problem. So it's a simplistic example, but if we go back to that customer who wants a hole in their wall, if the, what they're actually trying to solve is having music in a second room, you know you solved it when you hear music in the second room. It doesn't matter how you got there, whether it was wireless, whether it was drilling a hole in the wall to get a cable through, um, buying a second radio, whatever it is, you've solved the customer problem. And just a little point on how to measure that. There's a lot of debate about quantitative versus qualitative data methods. Should we all quantitative? It's the only truth in the numbers. Or should we all qualitative? We can only trust our users. But the bottom line is, you need both. Because the data can tell you what happened, but only your customers can tell you why it happened. And you need that combination to really understand what's happening, to, to be able to measure success, and to know whether you've solved the problem. So we set up our team, we figured out what success looks like. The last step is to figure out what the process should look like. One of my favorite quotes ever from one of the most prolific business authors, there's nothing quite so useless as delivering with great efficiency something that should not be done at all. And I think this is something that we in the IT industry, in software development, product development, product management, we've been guilty of. We've kind of been focused on this side of the pie, on delivering stuff. We have all these great methodologies from project management, Agile, Scrum, Lean, Kanban, 
I've used waterfalls, Six Sigma, Prince 2 as well. They're all great at delivering things. They're all great at knowing, I need to build this, and I need to build this as quickly, cheaply, and effectively as possible. And they almost all come from the Toyota production system, which is a factory line. We know we need to build this car, and we want to build this car as efficiently, as cheaply, as ever free as possible. And that's great. We need to do that. We need to be great at that. But we've kind of forgotten somewhere along the way that the guys who designed the car, the team that designed the car, they don't work like that. They can't work like that because they don't know what they're going to build. They're out there talking to customers, looking at the marketplace, doing discovery, trying to figure out what the problem is and how to solve that problem. And it's only once they have an idea of how to solve that problem that they switch into that production or delivery mode. And so we need to embrace both sides. We need to, and there's lots of great tools that we can use. We can copy from design thinking, design sprints, discovery sprints, do track agile. There's lots of great methodologies out there. And there's a million different ways to do good customer discovery. I'm sure we'll hear more about that later. And of course, there's no artificial line here in the middle. It's another thing we forget. One team does that, and then they ship a thing over here, and the other team does this. That doesn't work. It has to be one team doing it in cycles, continuously, testing, learning, responding. So beware of the dogma of all those methodologies out there. The Agile Manifesto, which I'm a huge fan of itself, says, we value responding to change over following a plan. And what is following mean or Agile or Kanban or anything else but following a plan? You have to figure out in your own teams what processes work for you, your market, your team, your company, your cadence. Hardware is going to look very different to software. And what I've seen the most successful teams do, every team does it slightly differently, even in the same company. So the last big team I ran had three or four autonomous teams. One was doing pure Kanban, one was doing Scrum, one was doing whatever the hell they wanted, basically, but they were performing. And it's what works for that team and what they're trying to achieve. So just to wrap up a little bit before we do a bit of a fireside chat, John Maida, who's a famous designer, said, don't forget that people make the stuff, but relationships make the bigger stuff. So if you get the relationships and the people part right, everything else will follow. Put together your team, make sure it's diverse, cross-functional, and co-located as much as possible. Set them up for success by thinking about psychological safety, autonomy, and purpose. And then pick the right process, making sure that you balance discovery and delivery. Or, if I translate that for you, hire smart people, get the hell out of the way, and focus on customer outcomes. Because product management is not about products. Product management is about people. Thank you very much.